Welcome back. I'm here with Kat Packer, Director of Drug Markets and Legal Regulation for the Drug Policy Alliance. And love, really love to have the chance to have the opportunity to Kat, to talk about your expertise in Los Angeles and theories, uh, obviously for business owners out there, but we're going to go more into the, I guess you can say more in the advocacy realm. And uh, by the way, to know what the Drug Policy Alliance is doing on a regular basis, I want to go and make sure to pass along to people the website, drugpolicy.org, drugpolicy.org. Make sure to look at that while we go along. A recent uh, Drug Policy Alliance press release recently wrote this, quote, President Biden was once an architect of pre- former President Clinton's harmful 1994 crime bill and the drug war it escalated. However, Biden has since come a long way at acknowledging our country's racist history of marijuana criminalization and enforcement. And as you mentioned, Kat, uh, at the start of the program, how about that on the 2020 campaign trail, he made a pledge to fully decriminalize marijuana. That has not happened, but his administration is now walking back on those promises instead of offering symbolic reform in place of real change. And black advocates, policy experts, health leaders, and marijuana reform supporters are calling him out and demanding better. So I want to make this point that, you know, while the president has not done even close to enough to address this right here in terms of those that have been oppressed, incarcerated, and upper underrepresented and marginalized, right? There has been at least some work in Congress, at least I could say, from all I've seen in the last, you know, couple of years, at least Congress is trying to again, ruff, ruffle up something to make something happen. So there's a, the three senators with Senator Schumer, Senator Booker, and Senator Wyden that have led the charge. Ron Wyden, Cory Booker, uh, Chuck Schumer. But now here's the thing is that while his Democratic colleagues are trying to make a push to get cannabis, at least give more relief to the cannabis industry or to legalize or decriminalize. I mean, I'll check Schumer's also said it himself. Why is it that President Biden is not in lockstep with his Democratic colleagues? Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think on one hand, uh, President Biden has always been much more conservative on the issue of cannabis policy reform than his Democratic colleagues, if you remember back to uh, the 2020 election. Um, when uh, Senator Booker was running for president as well, um, he called out President Biden on his past record uh, as you know championing some of uh, the the U.S.'s drug war policies, particularly the the crime bill. Uh, and President Biden in the 2020 election campaign, uh, to, to to his credit, acknowledged that his past uh, drug policies were harmful. Significantly, he also acknowledged that they had been particularly harmful uh, to to black and brown communities. Uh, but I think that there's this reality that historically, this is where the 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 president has positioned himself. Um, he he's he had always been a little bit more conservative than uh, other folks in uh, at least in his party. And I think that. Uh, my personal opinion is that I think on some efforts, he's trying to like play it safe. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, he he's trying to walk this line and, and be a little bit more uh, conservative in his rhetoric before he said that he wants to, quote unquote, follow the, the research and follow the science. Um, and, you know, we, we now have that research, but it's still not supporting uh, the, 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 the outcome is still not uh, is less than what he promised. And so, you know, one would hope that the Biden administration, particularly if marijuana is ultimately moved to Schedule 3, that the Biden administration would respond and say, you know, I've, I've done everything that I can do through this particular administrative process. It's resulted in Schedule 3. Schedule 3 is less than what I promised. Um, uh, I've, I've exhausted my administrative uh, uh, steps for the descheduling process, so I'm going to call on Congress to deschedule and decriminalize cannabis. That's something that he could do, and he, he's yet to do it yet. I think that he's, he, like, particularly right now, while this administrative review process is, is going on, um, I think he's, his administration is taking the position that they, they want to be able to uh, allow it to be an independent process. But nevertheless, I think that it would be important, um, particularly for, for the communities that President Biden made these commitments and promises to, for his administration and for him personally to acknowledge uh, that this falls short and then call on Congress uh, to to take action. He has a, an enormous bully pulpit uh, in the presidency 
Uh, and he, for example, could call on the Department of Justice to issue a new memo uh, for enforcement. He could call on the Department of Treasury uh, to issue new guidance for uh, banking for the cannabis industry. He can call on his Department of Education uh, to mitigate concerns related to employment barriers. He can do the same for Veterans Affairs. He can do the same for Housing and Urban Affairs. There's so much discretion uh, that these agencies have, and they haven't utilized it in a coordinated way. Again, I think we've seen it with the Department of Justice and the Treasury Department thus far. But if the president is truly committed to righting the wrongs of criminalization, um, we need to see more. Uh, and the reality is that he can do more. I, I'd understand if if uh, he had taken all of the steps that he could. Um, and he has taken some steps, right, at this point. Um, but there's this reality um, that there is more that he can do. And he can also call on the this other branch of, of uh, government in Congress to take steps as well. And in an ideal situation, we have both Congress and the Biden administration and the White House uh, saying that we need a new approach to cannabis, that we should be decriminalizing cannabis for personal use, and that we can work together to try and figure out uh, a new regulatory framework. This isn't impossible. Um, uh, it's it's just going to take leadership, and and that's what we're waiting for. I think when it comes to President Biden, and I don't think anybody looks back at, sometimes you just got to look back at history and see what you know, the previous stances were before. And, you know, listen, even Congress or congressmen can be subject to change their minds. Chuck Schumer himself said that, you know, he wasn't, he, he had probably had the same kind of like-minded, without paraphrasing, not saying that he exactly said this, but, you know, it wasn't until Colorado and the start of their program and the success and how, sa- you know, the safety of the public was going on in terms of how Colorado was able to roll out their medical and then adult use programs that, you know, it could be implemented. It was safe. It was effective. And you see a lot of people being helped by it. So that's why he changed his mind on what happened with that. And with uh, Senator White, it was just a matter that he, I guess he always had just that long-standing opinion about decriminalizing or de- or, or at least getting cannabis legalized in some way, shape, or form. But with, with President Biden back being a senator, he sat on a lot of. He was he was a chairperson on the Senate Judiciary hearing on the control of foreign drug uh, trafficking activities. He, uh, I always think about the Cocaine Cowboys documentary. I always kind of focuses on that. At him specifically talking to Barry Seal, who was the drug smuggler bringing in, you know, drugs from Colombia into the U.S. And I think that President Biden, or back then Senator Biden, couldn't distinguish between the two. Doesn't see in the last what thirty some odd year or forty years basically where the difference was in terms of how cocaine is one different illicit drug, but cannabis has been proven to be not in the same category, which is why, you know, just to see the final of the scheduling, I think it's always a matter of that there was a pressure that the HHS was being allowed to schedule. I don't know if it was so much his decision, because I think also at his advanced age, President Biden wasn't going to change his mind on this issue. And second, it was going to have to be that people need to be at the very top or within his ear they were got to, you know, persuade or push or pressure to make this possible. What do you think about that part? That maybe it was just part of the thing where that's why he's out of touch with his other, you know, colleagues as to why that never changed. It's one of those things of that. What do you think about that part? Yeah, I think I think it's interesting in part because I do think that the our perspective and I think collective, our collective perspective on this has changed. I think, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, folks may have said that, you know, criminalization is is the best approach that we should take. And that's uh, criminalization is actually going to promote public safety. Uh, We know better. Um, We we now have decades of of, uh, data from prohibition uh, and a decade of of data uh, from regulation. And what we can see that the data is if we actually want to do this responsibly and reduce harms associated with cannabis, the best way for us to do so is to regulate it, uh, not uh, prohibit it. And so I think that because we have these examples of you know now 24 different states that have these adult use programs and even medical programs um, that we're able to demonstrate what we've known, um, or at least what we now know, which is regulation is actually the public safety uh, strategy and that we actually want to take a public health uh, approach to, to this as well. Um, but I'm actually surprised uh, at, 
uh, and then maybe this is my naivete because, uh, you know, back back in the the day or in the '94 crime bill, I was three, uh, so I don't have any recollection of of what uh, President Biden was was doing back then. I watched a lot of videos to to get caught up with with all of this. Um, but but the reality is that his vice president, Vice President Harris, um, championed uh, legislation when she was a senator that would have legalized, completely descheduled cannabis. And I think that a lot of uh, cannabis reform advocates, you know, for, you know, despite uh, Vice President Harris's own history uh, with, with cannabis criminalization, were really expecting, uh, particularly because of the promises that were made, uh, that we would have seen more bold, courageous, and tangible uh, relief provided from this administration. Um, and and that's in part why I think a lot of communities, particularly black and brown communities and uh, cannabis communities that you know know that um, this is less than what is promised, are left wondering what's next. And that's the other part that Vice President Harris, I don't know if it was just a change of stance because as Attorney General in California, she was, you know, charging for cannabis related offenses and put a lot of people in jail as a result. I mean, you know, that that's been made pretty public. But at the same time, she put out her own bill to legalize. I don't understand. There's a part where I never the logic to put that all together about the change in that. Was there a change of heart or what there was to that? And even if she had a change of heart and how cannabis is right now. She didn't have enough pool to get to the president and say, hey, go ahead and go along with this. Let's go ahead and decriminalize. And the most important thing is that legalization or decriminalization, no matter what, that is a win for whichever side of the aisle that's on. If it's Democrats or Republicans, by the way, you want to win an election, legalize or decriminalize. You win. It's not even an issue. There's I not agree. any other reason about it. If you just did that part, for all the criticism that the the, the the Democrats or the progressives of the party or what President Biden has been doing right now, you know, you could almost wipe away, oh, the border issue or the fentanyl coming into the country or, you know, whatever other issues you want. The wars we have in other, in other countries that we're funding. You could almost wipe away all that if you just decriminalize or legalize cannabis. And I don't know why, you know, is it just that there's not enough, not enough money for the, from the lobbying, I guess? To get that to happen, I'm sure there's not enough lobbying money because obviously, but your big farmer has a big role to play in that. But like that's the part of like, okay, you're in election season. All these congressional folks are in running for re-election. Here's the easiest one you have. Don't just talk about it. You know, th- you can't use and talk about it anymore. Like you just can't do what President Biden did. Just say, okay, we're going to promise the decrim. No, no, do it. You can't yeah, just say no. it anymore. People don't want to hear that anymore. They don't want to hear political talk. Get it done. Yeah, we 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 want uh we want the Nike situation on here. We want we want the just do it. Uh, that's 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 how we feel about uh the the cannabis policy reform. But you're right. Like this is not a bi this is not a bipartisan or this this is not a partisan issue. Like Americans, period, support federal legalization. Both Republicans, Democrats, Independents. You know, everybody's got their own take on how. Uh, but what's been resolved at this point is that we should be decriminalizing, we should be legalizing. Um, and I think that, you know, the the sooner that our politicians are willing to follow uh, the will of the people, uh, the better off we, w- we will be on this. Um, but, you know, at, at this point, I think that part of what we also need to see um, our voters get involved and, and people recognize that their vote uh, matters uh, and we can't have candidates take our votes for granted. Uh, and in order for us to make sure that we don't have candidates taking our, our votes for granted, uh, we have an opportunity to weigh in and talk about this issue. We, we need to be calling for decriminalization. We need to be calling for uh, legalization. We can acknowledge you know, progress. We can acknowledge um, you know, whatever steps have been taken. But I think that while we have this opportunity, this moment that, you know, we, we haven't had in 50 years with this federal reevaluation, uh, we've got to utilize this moment uh, and speak with a united voice and say we're we're united for marijuana decriminalization. And I'm using that to plug 
uh, a coalition that I'm working with called United for Marijuana Decriminalization. You can find uh, more information at decriminalizemarijuana.com. Uh, but I'm working with a coalition of folks to do just that, to try and push the admon- administration uh, to support decriminalization uh, and to utilize its executive authority, uh, everything that it has in its executive authority uh, to right the wrongs of criminalization. Right. Now, when I think about it, there's um, it's amazing what we have in terms of the bipartisanship that has been coming on in bills anyway. You can bring up the what was the the state act with Elizabeth Warren and Cory Gardner. Jimmy Raskin and Nancy Mace working on a bill for cannabis for employees. When it comes to, what is it, uh, Jerry Nadler, Earl Blumenhauer, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, and others looking to decriminalize back in September. Like, there's been enough of issues where we see bipartisanship across the board continue to be put out there. So it's not that Congress has a problem. It's like, well, and then you can't expect, you know, the president is not going to just change his mind. It's just, it's too late for that to happen. You just need somebody else with a new mind and, that's going to get Congress to work together. And I will say, if it's decriminalization or legalization, it has to be a supermajority. And for those that think we're going to get happy talk and say, hey, you know, oh, maybe they'll happen next year or this election season. No, no. no. We need significant change in D.C. It's got to be one side or the other, not this, this hyper-divided thing that we have right now in the 50-50. It's been like this for a long time. And let's just say it like this, too. We've had presidential administrations that had Super majorities, one way or the other, to be able to go and do so. I mean, well, I mean, if somebody had the last chance to really go and decriminalize or, you know, give us legalization, it should have been President Obama. The first, his first term, he had the super majority. It should have happened then. But it wasn't the real chance to happen. It should have happened that long ago. But we didn't get the chance to do that. But again, you know, history, you know, hopefully we can change the course of that soon enough. Now, one thing I want to bring up before we go to, well, actually, let's go and go to commercial break. We're running out of time. My God, we were running so long. Uh, I'm here again with Kat Packer, Director of Drug Markets and Legal Regulation for Drug Policy Alliance. Again, drugpolicy.org is the website. I'm here again with Kat Packer, Director of Drug Markets and Legal Regulation for Drug Policy Alliance. Again, drugpolicy.org is the website. We're back after this. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. We're back here in Blunt Business with Kat Packer, Director of Drug Markets and Legal Regulation for Drug Policy Alliance. Kat, I'm losing track of time. We're having so much fun here. I'm yeah. really enjoying the talk. This has been great. What we? <laughs> it has been right. Oh, my goodness. So you may mention the HHS, uh, the, the scheduling, the medical side, the reviews. We've already gone through that. And, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to ask you a question about that. But besides the congressional di- gridlock we see right now, where with bills have been trying to put out there with bipartisan as terms of D.C., they've tried to do things, right? Safe banking, you know, let's put it, insert it into the National Defense Authorization Act. Let's try to put it into another omnibus spending bill. You know, not the best way to do it, but I understand the intent, and I appreciate that. Or, you know, they've tried to do a few things to try to incorporate maybe some other end of the Safe Banking Act with a couple of provisions taken out. Whatever they could do to try to get cannabis put through in some way besides the HHS, that cannabis, that Congress is trying to do something about it. Uh, what do you think about what D.C., Besides what President Biden has not been able to do or has not done, what do you think about what the congressional leaders have tried to do just to try to get something go through for cannabis, some kind of relief? Yeah. And you mentioned like there's been a lot of bipartisan activity with different folks introducing bills over the course of the last uh, couple of years to address different uh, federal issues in relation to cannabis. So whether this is veterans access or uh, small business administration access or protections for housing uh, access to food benefits, et cetera. Uh, so there have been a bunch of like standalone bills that address different things. And then there have been been a number of um, pieces of legislation that we at DPA refer to as comprehensive descheduling bills, uh, things like the uh, War Act, the Cannabis Administration Opportunity uh, uh, and Administration Act, and uh, things like Nancy Mesa's States Reform Act. Uh, and so we've seen all of this different activity where folks are introducing bills, but um, for for all of the, the kind of criticisms we've, we've mentioned uh, about the administrative efforts thus far, there, there also have been challenges uh, in Congress as well. You know, it's one thing to introduce a bill, it's another thing to get that bill uh, passed, and, and that's what 
uh, folks in the advocacy space have not been successful at uh, thus far. Um, I think I read last year, um, in part because I had kind of just tr- transitioned over the course of the last two years uh, from from doing local regulatory work to, to now working at uh, the federal level. Uh, but I read an article that said that you know folks have been working on the State Banking Act or some form of that for ten years now, right? Like this this is like the tenth year of just trying to get protections for banks who are doing business with the the cannabis industry. Um, and even that hasn't passed thus far. And so for me, that tells me a couple of things. I think one, uh, there's been a lot of like debate happening in DC about whether or not it makes sense to like do incremental reforms or uh, comprehensive reform. That a lot of the times uh, when these debate happens and folks, particularly advocates, push for comprehensive reform, uh, the pushback is, well, then we won't get any incremental reform done. Well, to those folks who feel that way, the incremental reform that the industry has been focused on for the last 10 years has been state banking, and that's made it nowhere. Uh, and I think that part of the reason why um, the industry has been unsuccessful in moving federal legislation isn't necessarily because there aren't a number of policymakers who don't sympathize with them or understand their plight, but this this issue of state banking is not like one that is popular to the American people. American people don't necessarily know about the barriers that cannabis industry businesses face. They know about, they probably know somebody who went to jail uh, for cannabis, or maybe they know someone who uses cannabis um, and, and understand that that's illegal at the federal level. And so I think that if the industry and folks were to come together and focus on reforms that uh, you could get, you can mobilize people behind, you can get masses of uh, people to, to organize behind it, the industry uh, would do a lot better. But because it's been focused on such a narrow kind of scope of issues, um, at least in terms of what's been prioritized over the course of the last two years since since I've been following this closely, um, I think that that's been part of the industry's failure thus far. I think the industry would be much further along uh, if it actually centered um, or at least included in some of the legislation that it's trying to prioritize um, addressing issues that impact a broader populations of, of people because people can get behind that and support that uh, and I think a, a more uh, intentional way. I think that this conversation about rescheduling is going to pass the potential uh, and I think it will be a catalyst to uh, efforts in Congress to react. There will be a reaction from Congress from this. And I anticipate seeing different bills introduced in, in response to whatever final uh, decision comes out. But I think the issue will remain um, that uh, in order to move something to, through Congress, uh, that we, we need to have our uh, elected officials and leaders, uh, one, working together to understand what these issues are, uh, and then two, willing to work together to prioritize passing these things through Congress. And and far too often, cannabis is simply either not prioritized um, or, you know, it's caught up in the larger forced trading and negotiation that happens uh, in, in D.C. So, for example, the reason why the State Banking Act is, isn't moving right now actually has nothing to do with the cannabis industry. There's a specific provision of the State Banking Act um, that applies to banking generally. Uh, and that's that's the particular provision uh, that's that's holding out negotiations right now. So this is like, you know, it's, it's not even cannabis, right? At, at least at this moment, um, that's that's being the issue of, of holding that particular piece up. Uh, and there will continue to be barriers. But I think if we um, can focus on decriminalization, efforts to advance equity and making sure that individual people have rights to possess, use, uh, personally cultivate um, that's the type of thing that you can, you know, that Americans can get behind. Well, let's talk about expungements. So we've already mentioned how President Biden in his 2020 campaign made the promise to decriminalize. Well, the one thing he did actually do technically, but I will say it's performative at best, was that he was going to expunge those those that were uh, convictions for possession or distribution but and he said at a campaign event in South Carolina, January 27th, he had mentioned, quote, I keep my promise when I said no one. No one should be in prison for merely possessing marijuana or using it, and the record should be expunged, a promise made and a promise kept. But the cannabis pardons that he did create 
only happened for a very small few, extended to individuals whose offenses took place in District of Columbia and other lands under the jurisdiction of federal law. The vast majority of arrests and convictions for civil possession and use of marijuana had taken place at local and state levels. And that's why I said, I'm, I'm personally saying it's performative. Like, I, I get what he tried to do, but when you look at the, the, the real fine print, yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was just that, to try to throw, the, the, everybody saw the headline, they didn't see what it actually was. Let's just say it like that. And that's my opinion only. But because of that, I feel like that's one of the reasons where the HHS recommendation took place, because that expungement announcement didn't serve the president or the administration as intended. Do you feel that? Do you feel like that might have been what happened with the HHS? This is why it happened because of the fact that this announcement for expunging offenses it really wasn't what it was. Um, I I have to believe that uh, based on what the administration has done thus far, that they've only done like uh, they've only addressed like the tip of the iceberg. Like there's there's a longer list of issues that they can address. And this is probably just I'm hoping, right, that they're that they actually have the list of things that need to be done and that they've they've only, you know, taken these few steps. But even in relation to the the pardons, right, I just want to clarify what the president promised was expungements and what he has been able to grant thus far have been pardons. And there are a difference between expungements, which would completely eliminate and erase a person's record and a pardon, which is a certificate that folks can get uh, that essentially uh, provides uh, forgiveness uh, from the federal government for that particular record. But but that record still exists. And so it can still be a barrier and there is still a need for those records to be completely eliminated. Now, the reality is that, um, you know, in order for an expungement process to, to happen, Congress would need to act. But that's another one of these issues where instead of acting like he's actually delivered on a promise, take the action to actually do the thing that you said that you were going to do. Uh, call on Congress to support legislation uh, that would create an expungement process uh, to deliver uh, on that promise. So um, I, I think that there are a number of steps that the uh, administration uh, uh, can take. Um, and, you know, to the extent that we can we can point these things out and, and help them move along, I think that it's in their best interest to uh, do more because people expect more. I think I, my, my concern is that a lot of folks are going to try and like do a victory lap about this. And I think a lot of industry folks, right, are going to do an, a victory lap in part because they're going to be uh, relief from 280E, this this tax provision, and, and they should, uh, right? Like folks shouldn't be subject to uh, this penalty. Uh, but I think it's going to leave a lot of communities, particularly black and brown communities, feeling like, um, why, why were we targeted with this rhetoric, but not with action? Right. Well, because, okay, at the end of 2023, 11 people were given clemency, and the other ones, there were going to be some expansions of, you know, pardoning those a, a civil possession on federal lands eligible. Doesn't mean that they actually got off of those charges or that those charges were cleaned of the record. Nothing said at all. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. But, well, and you would know the stat if I'm instead of me looking for it. What would be an accurate amount of those that are in prison right now, local, state, uh, that are in uh, that are improperly or that that are being that are now incorrectly being um, incarcerated for drug offenses? What would be the the amount right now if you had a, a number that the Drug Policy Alliance has been quoting? Yeah, I want to say that there are at least a, uh, like uh, multiple tens of thousands of people. Um, the uh, last prisoner project, admittedly, uh, has some of the the best uh, data around this uh, to today, um, particularly trying to to track. And that's part of the issue is that all of this data is in a bunch of different places. So local jurisdictions have their data, state have its, has its data, and then uh, the the federal government has its data. But in relation to the pardons that have been issued thus far, it's important to note, and, and you you said this, um, like a lot of people were excluded. It only included things like simple possession or attempted possession. Uh, most of the people who are, it, it didn't release a single person from prison. Most of the people who are in prison for cannabis-related offenses are there for tra trafficking offenses. Um, and one of the things that President Biden said in his announcement when he was talking about you know, providing relief and pardons, he was just like, you know, 
this is an activity that many states no longer prohibit. Well, many states also no longer prohibit manufacturing and the engagement of business. And so I think that if we're going to have a conversation about pardons and expungements, uh, we also have to uh, make sure that we are putting measures in place to to take care of uh, offenses beyond possession. Um, you know, eighty percent of the folks who are, are who are serving time for those uh, elevated cannabis uh, offenses beyond possession are black and brown. ACLU, ACLU actually put quite a bit of information about all there was. There said that was uh, in drug arrests in twenty ten, fifty two percent were all for marijuana. They mentioned the fact that. Uh, over 7 million people have been busted for having cannabis from 2001 to 2010. And they also made the mention was uh, that blacks have been nearly four times more likely than whites to be arrested for cannabis possession. And they also made a mention that states, for forcing cannabis laws every year, they waste $3.6 billion. States. A year. Incredible. This is the part where, you know, the case has been made and, you know, as you said, last prisoner project, they said, you know, probably more trials re- around the year. You have 30 to 40,000 that are incarcerated right now that are not going to see any pardon as a result of this right here. Nothing's going to happen of that as, as a moment of this point right here. So there's a lot that's going on with this. And like I said, it didn't do anything. There are obviously people that are, you know, a various you know, people of color. If they know anyone that is in jail right now or incarcerated because of possession or distribution, well, they're not getting out of jail. They, they don't know anybody that's gotten out for any of these federal uh, prisons that are getting out. They don't hear about it. I don't think there's a lot of people that are in Leavenworth right now that are probably, you know, that were being pardoned as a result of this. But we don't really don't know the information about it. And that's the other part that's not being said about who's eligible. And if any of those folks that are being put under this supposed pardon or oh, well, the ones that are going to be out in the first place. We don't know anything about that. So I want to think one more thing about decriminalization that you brought up on the program. And by the way, this is going to be most likely a two-part episode because we've gone so long on this, but this was so worth it. So, Kat, you were on the Cash Color Cannabis podcast. I'm going to paraphrase what you actually said on the program. Quote, there are lots of leaders, even presidential candidates, that say on the campaign trail that they support states' rights. So if you're willing to support the ability for states to make a decision, then why wouldn't you support decriminalization? Because it's only under a framework of decriminalization that there are going to be penalties in place for the states that make a decision. So talk about your stance on decriminalization and why you feel it serves a better purpose for the state programs that have been rolled out or the legalization efforts that are being made in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and this this kind of gets back to our conversation of uh, rescheduling versus decriminalization and, and descheduling. Um, but... The reality is that as long as marijuana is a controlled substance under the un, under the Controlled Substances Act, as long as it's scheduled, it's going to be criminalized under federal law. And uh, the criminalization under federal law means that state programs, state laws, whether there are state laws that are creating uh, medical marijuana programs and medical access or are authorizing uh, adult use and recreational access uh all of those programs will still be legal and those laws will still be in com- conflict uh, with federal law. And so what I was mentioning on cash color cannabis was that I think that there's this disconnect uh, in, in some of the understanding, uh, maybe from some policymakers, because you'll have folks, and I mentioned in, in this particular example, like presidential candidate Nikki Haley, uh, who says that she supports the position of states' rights. Uh, and wants to defer to the states on uh, on on uh, decisions of cannabis. Well, in order to practically implement uh, her position, the uh, best pathway to do so, and really the only pathway to do so, would be to remove cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, uh, to decriminalize it, so that those state laws that actually did authorize uh, medical programs or recreational programs wouldn't be in violation. Uh, of state law. Now, decriminalizing or descheduling cannabis uh, at the federal level would not require any states to create medical marijuana programs or adult use programs. So it it actually is a situation that best fosters a decision where states can take the lead on what uh, cannabis policy should look like. And I think all of our efforts thus far, you know, the 10 years of, of cannabis regulation that's happened uh, at the state level, I think that most folks 
uh, who, who are doing this work, um, at least in the advocacy space, in the industry space, are of the position that we still want the, st- the states to lead cannabis policy reform. We, we don't necessarily want to be in a situation where we have a third layer uh, of bureaucracy and, and licensing and taxation and all of these things unnecessarily and not thoughtfully. And so we're not asking necessarily the federal government to you know, immediately take the lead and drive this train. It's more so how do we create a process where they can uh, learn from what's happened uh, at the, the state level uh, thus far. Um, and um, I think that decriminalization, descheduling, uh, puts us in a position where we can better support uh, states' rights. Uh, so if you support states' rights, even if you, you know, uh, fashion yourself to, to, to uh, be more conservative on the issue, and, and even if you supported a state maintaining prohibition, you could support decriminalization at the federal level uh, and state prohibition. I'm not going to encourage you to do so because that's not where I stand on the issue. Uh, but I think that folks are having a hard time understanding mechanically the difference between federal law and state law and the implications between the two. We're going to leave the conversation there. Kat, this is really wonderful you've been on with us and, and really appreciate you taking time out to go and talk so many areas from business into this end of, you know, the ongoing push that we have out there to try to see something happen when it comes to legalization, decriminalization of cannabis, which obviously the whole industry wants to go and see because of what it will do in terms of the impact to the rest of the nation and then all these other states that have not had a chance to be a part of this. There's so much more that can happen that we were looking forward to seeing. But again, the conversation continues. We'll just have to keep talking about it. So again, uh, website is drugpolicy.org. And if you can tell me real quickly about where people can go and, you know, if you're going to be speaking anywhere uh, in the coming months or, you know, what else Strict Policy Alliance is doing right now that people should be aware of. Absolutely. If you're interested in following more of my work uh, with the Drug Policy Alliance, you can follow drugpolicy.org or visit deschedulemarijuana.com. If you're interested in more information about the coalition I've been working with, United for Marijuana uh, Decriminalization, you can go to decriminalizemarijuana.com. Uh, we're really hoping to encourage folks to call on the administration uh, to take uh, further actions on federal marijuana reform and to support federal marijuana decriminalization. So thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Again, here with Kat Packer, Director of Drug Markets and Drug Legal Regulation for the Drug Policy Alliance. Thank you for being on with us and thank you listeners for listening in. We'll talk to you next time.